Hey everybody, welcome to PC Perspective. I'm Ryan Shrout, joined by Alan Malvintano. Uh, we are here today to talk about a new launch from Intel, Haswell E, yep. X99, new high-end enthusiast processors. Alan, you have some kind of you you like these parts? Like you, ha your system is still based on what? Go ahead, tell us. Admit to everybody what it's based on. X58 uh, okay. Core i7 920. Right. So a similar idea. For years. Right. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you know we we've seen Sandy Bridge E, mm -hmm. Ivy Bridge E, and, and yep. now Haswell E. And all you know what? Not I'll say all they're doing is they take the Sandy Bridge architecture, they remove the graphics, yeah, and they make it better, faster. You know, quad channel memory, three channel. Yours has three channel memory, right? Yes. The 920 does. Um, and then Ivy Bridge, they did the same thing. And Haswell, either doing the same thing. They are mm -hmm. taking the Haswell architecture, removing the graphics, replacing that dumb, dirty dual DDR3 memory controller, dual yeah, channel. Yeah, get rid of that. Get rid of that junk yeah. and dropping in a quad channel DDR4 mm -hmm. controller. So uh, what I have here is this is the new processor. We'll, we'll give you a closer up shot of it. Uh, this is the 5960X, Core i7 5960X. This is the last, what is this? This is a, this is a Haswell, oh, this is an, uh, a Sandy Bridge E part, a 3930 part. Um, they have essentially the same socket 2011, LGA 2011. Yeah. Um, but they are different. You can't can't plug one into can't the other. Can't plug one into the other, anything like that. We've got a new chipset, uh, 2011 V3 is what they call the socket, mm -hmm. right? So there are some differences there. It also looks different than any previous yeah. generations, but I think it's all cosmetic and retention options there. Um, so the, the 5960X specification wise is awesome. It's eight cores, 16 threads, yeah. 20 megs of cache. That's a lot of cache. 40 lanes of PCI Express 3.0. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, I mean, okay, so that's not like a new thing, 40 lanes. But. It was 2.0 before. Oh. So it is kind of new. So it is a new thing. All right. Yeah. So uh, we've got 40 lanes of that on this part. Uh, base clock speed, 3 gigahertz. Boost clock speed, 3.5 gigahertz. Those are on the low side. Not right? bad for would, eight cores. But, but again, it's, it's, it's the eight cores that you have to worry about, yeah. right? Uh, if we, you know, hopefully you guys, if you, if you haven't yet, go to PCPro.com and check out our review uh, of this particular processor. But I want to show you um, one of the benchmarks here that kind of demonstrates the, the frequency concern, I guess, right? This is a Cinebench single-threaded result. And if you look at it, the Haswell E 5960X is coming in at a score of 1.55, right? Whatever, whatever, it's, it's, it's a point score. But if you look, it is significantly lower than the Core i7-4790K, which is a Haswell Devil's Canyon part. Yep. Uh, and it's lower than the 4770K, and it's lower than the 4670K. And we're getting down into some, some lower end, but all that not is... lower end, but very mainstream processors. Yeah, but that's all one thread. It's all one thread. Yeah. Because the 4790K can go up to 4.4 gigahertz mm -hmm. on a single thread, and this part, this new part can only go up to 3.5. So single thread, single core, goes a little faster. But the, the you know this is not the fastest processor you're going to have. Yep. Okay. But look at the multi-threaded result, right? <laughs> and this is where things shift. All right. So now you're talking about the 4790K, which is a quad-core part. Yep. Versus 5960X, which is a eight-core part. Now it's not double the performance, but again, you've got that frequency difference. Yes. Uh, the 4790K is probably running at 4.1 or 4.2 gigahertz while it's doing this. Yeah. And the 5960X is probably running at 3.1 or 3.2 while it's performing this operation. So it still beats it, just so the brute force of Brute of force cores. of eight cores yeah. and 16 threads, right? Versus yep. four cores and eight threads. And you can see, if you look at that benchmark graph, you know, the 4960X, that's a six core part. That's a previous Ivy Bridge E flagship. Big advantage here for the new platform, you know, mm -hmm. down to Sandy Bridge E, and you've got other parts in there as well. Do we have right. hyperthreading on for that test too? Hyperthreading is always on. Oh, okay. Yep. Well, you, I mean, you can disable the BIOS, but it's on for all these tests. Sure. Um, so performance-wise, you, you kind of know what you're going to get, right? In in highly threaded applications, mm -hmm. you're going to get unbelievable performance. Yeah. Assuming the application can use that many threads, because now you're you need like 16. Yeah. 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 Well, actually, if you look at this test here, this is interesting, the Euler test, uh, which is kind of like a, a 3D simulation or a, a fluid simulation test, mm -hmm. we're showing you 1, 2, 4, 6, 8, and 12 thread yeah, you're able to combinations. Set that, yeah. And it's always interesting because if you look at the result here in the 8 threads, it's actually, the 8 thread is the highest result, 12 threads is a little bit lower. Hmm. Because this particular benchmark shows you that 
it's it's it wants full access to the full core as opposed to sharing it with hyperthreading. Oh, uh, okay. Right. So. Uh, so hyperthreading actually, you're, you're right. seeing the. Uh, the overhead of hyperthreading, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah. So it, even if you look at the four-core result, which is the yellow bar, the Haswell E is actually higher than the 4790K. And my guess is because hmm. it's got four other cores that other tasks can be handling normal window stuff yeah. or you know tertiary things that this test may individually do. So um, even if you're only running very headed, very heavily threaded, like four-thread apps, sure, you probably will still see an advantage with the something like the yeah, 59 because you have whole additional cores to run the other. Yep. Just anything else other than whatever that program is, yeah. Now, there are three parts being released today. We only have, the we only have one part in our review, the 5960X. This is the flagship Extreme Edition $1,000 processor. Yep. Right? It's expensive. No way to get around it. Uh, but also being released today are the uh, 5930K and the 5820K. All right. Both of those parts are less expensive, 583 and 389, mm -hmm. respectively. They drop from eight cores to six cores. 20 megs of cache to 15 megs of cache. Okay. 25% of your cores, 25% of your cache. Six core in just the bottom one? Six core in both. Oh, okay. The middle and the and the bottom tier. The right. bottom tier, the 5820K, it uh, is differentiated by the fact that it moves from 40 lanes of PCI Express to 28 lanes of PCI Express. Hmm. It's an interesting change. It's the first time they've ever done this on uh, what I am calling an E-class yeah. platform. It's still more than 16. It's definitely more than 16. It's about 12 more yeah, yeah. than 16. By Might my be man. enough to, in case you, you know, if you weren't doing really crazy SLI or Crossfire, yeah, you so might be able to say, well... 28 well, lanes you know. is 8884. Yeah. Right, so you can do three-way SLI <clears throat> and have room for a PCI Express SSD. Yeah, like a buy four. Yeah. Or you can have, uh, you know, two-way SLI and have, <coughs> excuse me, a, a whole 16-lane or eight-lane slot to do something with. How convenient is that, that the Intel PCI Express SSDs are, uh, they chose to go buy four 3.0 <laughs> instead of buy eight 2.0. It's, it's, hey, you know, you mm, do what you can do. Yeah, that's good. You know, I, I still think the 5820K is going to be a fantastic part mm -hmm. for uh, people who want to do multi-GPU, they want to get in a DDR4 memory, yeah. uh, and they don't want to pay $1,000 for a processor. They're, they're much more comfortable paying 389 or yeah, whatever I mean, it happens Less than 400 be. is pretty good considering what it is. Now, with the new uh, processor comes new chipsets and thus new motherboards, which mm -hmm. you can see a couple of them here in front of us. Pretty motherboards. We have the Asus X99 Deluxe and the EVGA uh, X99 Micro ATX. But <clears throat> I see diamond cut cam chamfered edges on, <laughs> on the heatsink there. If it makes it better, then, then more power to you. Hmm. This is the board we use for all of our testing. Initially, yep. this is the first board we got in. It has some pretty cool features on it. Um, I just like seeing a wall of blue USB ports on the back. All USB 3.0 ports yeah, well, on there's it? there's a couple USB 2.0. Oh, are for, there? Okay. Just for... Uh, How many USB 3.0 you got? That's 10. <laughs> That's a lot. Yeah, and then, and then two more because, you know, you just want to make sure your keyboard and mouse are... I count 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 SATA ports on yeah, here. Obviously yeah. not all from the chipset. 10, 10, 10 from come the from the chipset. Yeah, which is pretty good. A block of six and then a block of four. So yeah, our dream yeah. of doing 10-way uh, RAID 0 you can't do was ten cut way. short. Yeah. It was it cut do, short. It'll still do six-way. It could. Yeah. Like with, with the chipset doing the RAID, in other words. Right? They did a really cool thing with this motherboard. Uh, I don't know if you saw it. So they have an M.2 port here. It is PCI Express performance, but right. it, it mounts vertically. Yeah, that's pretty good. Because, I mean, you got a motherboard like this. There's not a whole lot of board space left. Yeah. Mount that buddy vertically. You've got this bracket here to attach it, mm -hmm. and you can still get so. Bracket doesn't have to be there, but if you're going to. Right. This board doesn't support four way SLI because of the layout. You've only got room for three graphics cards in it. But hey. Oh, darn, only three. Only three way SLI, and then you can add this for your PCI Express storage. That's and true. you've still got the full gamut of stuff here. So mm -hmm. you're talking uh, eight DIMM slots. Currently, we're limited to 8 gigabyte DIMMs, mm -hmm. so 64 gigs of memory available. There will be 16 gigabyte DIMMs pretty soon. Um, DDR4 is currently pretty expensive. Yeah. Uh, but it will get better. It making <laughs> making the, the more the higher capacity DIMMs even yet more expensive. Yeah, 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 yeah. It will get, it, it will get better. Um, oh. So, Maury's going to have a review of uh, this board, the x 9 Deluxe, coming out very soon. I think on Monday, mm -hmm. he'll have this ready. And I'm going to do a little playing around with this, build some systems uh, with the mini ITX form factor from EVGA. I think uh, Maury got sent the EVGA classified 
X99 board. So the, the cool. high-end kind of flagship part there. I love this BIOS flashback on the Asus boards. Yeah, they, they've got a lot of cool stuff there. Let me let me show you something else. So this, the, the X99, or I'm sorry, the Haswell E platform is a TDP of 140 watts. Yep. Significantly higher than the TDP of uh, basic Haswell, which is like 88 or 90. Yeah, but eight cores. I know, but even better, look at our power consumption numbers. If you look at our load power consumption numbers, you'll see this top part, Haswell E, is not really higher than the 4790K. Now, the 4790K is an extreme case of Haswell. Sure. It is the overclocking friendly part yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that, that runs at a higher frequency than everything else. But if you even take the 4770K down here, 127 watts, this is system level power, not just processor level power. So you jump from 127 to 169 watts for full threaded, 100% load yeah. testing. No, it's like they're all staying within good. that same very close TDP yeah. range, right? Yep. How much, how much worse was it overclocking? Did we do like power measurements for overclocking? Uh, I did actually, and I don't know if I have that in the story, but exclusive to the video here, yeah. um, I don't know where that number is. I do have no. that. It, it was, oh wait, no. Yeah, it went up quite a bit. Okay. Like uh, I think we're looking at maybe another 100 watts. Yeah, but 120 watts. But at that point, that. it's breathing fire. So you know, I mean, <laughs> it's trying. To, it's trying to do it. What was the percent overclock you got on it? Uh, well, let me show you the benchmark or the overclocking results. So again, base clock of three, boost clock of three point five. Okay. Um, you know, how we, was the boost clock like when you're running multi? Like, was it able to stay at boost? No, I mean the three point five is really where it's at when you're doing one thread. Yeah. One and two threads. Right, just three like and four one threads is like three, three point four gigahertz. Oh, okay, so it tapers. It tapers and... down. Okay. Yeah, like the other parts had done. Um, but for our overclocking, I just kind of went into the BIOS. Let me show you the screenshot here. We we set the voltage to one point three volts, which is kind of on the high side, but yeah, reasonable. Yeah. And uh, what is we got here? Oh, four point six gigahertz. So it's like to... right out of like right away. And it stayed at four point six. It's four point six all, all eight cores. Okay. So all eight cores would normally max out, but three, it would two, drop down to three two or three maybe. Maybe three know. three. Okay. Yeah, at the high and probably three two or three one. So you're adding another what? That's like fifty percent of to your clock speed. Yeah, right. And so you're you're gonna add a lot of power because of that. Uh, yeah. I will so 50 say fifty percent more clock speed, yeah. not backing off anymore. No. With with all the cores running, and. How, how much power does it consume without the overclock? What's the TDP? The system power, well, the TDP is 140. All right, so I guess it is like so another... So you're going up to 240, so it's 260. Kind of, it's kind of linear, kind of. It, like... it works pretty well. I, you know, we could probably do some tests like overclock it to certain levels, but yeah, then you've got to adjust the voltage, more. right? You want, to be the, you want to be at the minimum voltage for each of those overclocks yeah. to really be... But for really such a big percent there. overclock, like, you know, it's, to even have a similar percentage power draw increase... Is, yep. is, that's good. Yeah. So when you think about overclocking, again, if we go back to that Devil's Canyon versus Haswell E discussion. Yep. Uh, yeah, how was overclocking on that? Overclocking on that was, was okay, like 4.9 yeah. to 5. That's good. Right? But yeah. you're, so now you're talking about not that much more frequency over what you get with Haswell E with 8 right. cores instead. Right. So uh, look at performance uh, of a benchmark like Pavre we have here, where uh, stock setting was 2687. The score was 2687. Right. After the OC, it goes up to 3668, a 36% increase in performance over the stock 5960X. Wow. Um, and again, this was I'm using a Corsair H100i. So a 240 millimeter, you know, two, two fan yeah. self-contained water cooling kit, but you need a good very a very consumer friendly. Like it's not like I, I didn't do yeah. custom loop right, right. radiators or anything yeah, like you that. You didn't this have to roll your own water cooler. And you can get an off-the-shelf yeah. water cooler that does yeah. this. Yeah, but if you have a lesser off-the-shelf water cooler, it might not be able to handle. Yeah, if you have like a single rad, especially like single thickness. Yeah, um, you'll be able to get by stock without a problem. Yeah, but once you crank it up. But overclocking, that became an issue. We had yeah. we tried an H80 first, and we saw temperatures into the 90s yep. of Celsius. That's bad news. Yeah. Uh, with the H100, we were in the 70s. Yeah, and it climbs quick. Like, once you kind of have saturated <laughs> the, yeah. the smaller water the cooler. The temperature gets hot. It just, yeah, it's quick. just like you kind of get a tipping point thing going there, and yeah. it just starts skyrocketing, yeah. Um, so, you know, check out our review at, at, at my review at PCPro.com. It's got a, a ton of benchmarks in there. You know, this is, this is a platform that really the 5960X specifically, because of its $1,000 price point, 
is going to have a limited audience, limited yep. target audience. But yep. I really do believe that the 5930K and the 5820K, mm -hmm. even though they're six cores and not eight, um, they will have a much larger audience, people that are interested in them. I mean, we've seen sales already today. The processor just launched today, and we see sales where I think Micro Center has them for, is it 900, 600, 300? Wow, right? really? Yeah. It's like $80 off the, yeah. the low end? Yeah, I don't know how they do it. It's in-store only. Like, you can't order it online, I don't think. You have to actually go to a Micro Center store to do it. Well, we have one close to Idle. Yeah, it's like 45 minutes away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there it's you worth go. 80 bucks. Finally upgrade that Core i7-920. Still got to get the motherboard <laughs> and everything else. Uh, yeah, but, they, and, you know, whatever it is. So I mean, That's like, what I always do, right? I always get, like, the bottom end one. But then I overclock it so much that yeah. it's like easily outperforming like the I would top end I would one. imagine that the uh, the all three of these parts would overclock relatively the yeah, same it should be pretty you pretty know good. maybe a little bit more because of six cores instead of eight but it's still, yeah. it's still the same die yep. on there um, it's a big chip uh, you know the x99 motherboards are a little bit on the expensive side in yes. general yeah um, that's know, probably more of a we, holdback. We for found me those then. for like 200 bucks as low as 200 bucks but how much was this uh, x99 deluxe like four 400 bucks or something like that. Yeah. Like, this has a whole bunch of, this came with a riser card yeah, that's for all sorts of extra PCIe bells and, and it had an external fan kind of header controller. This has all the bells and whistles for the Asus one. Um, you know, the $200 one is going to be as bare bones as you can get, yeah. but it's still X99 and DDR4 and all that. And then DDR4 memory is your other new expense. Um, We've minim seen some minimum, of that kind of cheap. But... Minimum price, $210 yeah. or something like that. But for how much? Uh, six, 16 gigs of yeah. 2133. If you want something like 2800 megahertz DDR4 and 16 gig kit, you're looking more 350 and above dollars, right? So it's a significant investment. I'm not, you know, yeah. trying to turn to, to, to. It all get adds up, that. right? I mean, yeah. you're switching to a new platform. And but it's not a. Yes. It's new not. New type of RAM, new platform. Yep. Like, and it's not yeah. more of a price premium than previous, uh, you know, E class yeah. part launches have been at, right? So uh, there will be, you know, when you go to the system builders, you'll see the, you know, the, the flagship motherboard like this, like the X99 Deluxe or at EVGA Classified. Right. Uh, you'll see the, the $1,000 5960X and you'll see three-way SLI and you'll see 64 gigs of DDR4 memory uh, and it'll be $100,000 or whatever it's going to be, you know, $4,000 or something. Uh, yeah. But you can, you can get it for a more modest price if you... If you try, I think we were basically playing around 1500 bucks. You should be able to get that. But uh, make sure you check out the review. Uh, lots of details, pretty pictures. Look at the DDR4 memory. Uh, look at the different uh, uh, packaging for uh, the 5960X. And hopefully, hopefully very soon, we'll be able to get our hands on that 5930K and 5820K to really kind of evaluate it mm -hmm. or those parts separately and independently of this, see where the performance is out of the box, what the overclocking is, and all that. So uh, next up, we are going to be, we're going to kick Alan out, and then we're going to be joined by uh, Matt Dunford from Intel, who has one of the coolest titles I think you'll ever, you'll ever hear. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk to him about what they're doing for Haswell E and uh, ask him some of the technical questions that maybe we didn't have answered yet. Hello, everybody. We are joined by Matt Dunford, who has, I think, probably one of the coolest titles I have heard in a long time, Principled, or I'm sorry, Principal Evangelist at Intel. Matt, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ryan. Could you uh, explain to me kind of what your role is at Intel or maybe what that title is supposed to mean for us? Well, this is uh, actually a very fun job. I enjoy it. I've been doing it now for over a decade. And the great thing about it is I get early access to all of the cool new hardware. So when uh, new products are going to be coming out, I'm in the group that evaluates them, looks at uh, you know how well do they perform, what's the battery life going to be, what's the user experience. And then from that, we'll try to determine you know what is it that people are going to really care about the most. And then I get to go out and communicate that to people like you. Okay, uh, that makes sense. So you are kind of, are, would you say you are evaluating these products, you know, in a finished form, well before finished form, kind of determining what features and, and, and features and performance these products might have? At what point in the stage do you feel like you get involved? Yeah, when we um, first start looking at them, uh, they're, you know, sometimes barely wiggling. And so <laughs> you'll start looking at them and working with the engineering team that's doing all of the debug. And then hopefully, as we get closer to launching the product, it becomes much healthier and 
<laughs> sometime in the few weeks before launch, we expect to have products that are uh, delivering the expected performance and battery life that will go live when people begin selling the products. Right. So it's important to point out that even though obviously we're here talking today about uh, a super high-end enthusiast platform like Haswell E and the Core i7-5960X and the X99 chipset, you also do this same kind of stuff for uh, your ultra low power tablets uh, and even those things that were when we were going into the phone ecosystem, right? So uh, all big, kind of a wide spectrum of devices that you have to deal with. Yeah, it keeps the job interesting. So it's kind of fun to look at, you know, from phones to tablets to the very high end. You know, we can uh, talk about the very low power up to the high power, kind of like the beauty and the beast. Um, and we kind of draw the line. We don't get into the real enterprise space of servers and workstations. Gotcha. Well, that's good to know. Maybe we'll bring you back when it's time to talk about Broadwell Y. Uh, I know we've got teases about that. Uh, and I know IDF is coming up, so maybe we'll learn some more interesting stuff uh, there Great. as well. So let's talk about uh, Haswell E, X99 chipset. This is obviously a pretty exciting time for you guys. I, I, I honestly don't know what it's like to kind of work with a product for as long as you probably work with it uh, and, and finally see it released. Uh, what is that like for you guys today? What is kind of happening at the office today with the team that is evaluating? Are you just kind of reading all the reviews and making sure that it meets the expectations that you thought you had for it? Or are you eating cake and drinking champagne? What's kind of what's going on <laughs> behind you there? No, that's a great question. We're, uh, we're still working hard today. We have a lot of people that are up at PAX um, where they're doing the launch event. Uh, and then back here behind the scenes, we are, we're going out looking at a lot of the reviews, uh, reading through them to make sure that we communicated things properly, that we didn't make any mistakes. And if there are anything that was misunderstood, we'll uh, contact people and let them know that, you know, perhaps they might want to revisit looking at something in their review if there might have been a typo or something right. like that. And so lots of reviews to read and, you know, maybe some uh, video interviews to do. So today's kind of a work day instead of a celebration. Maybe we'll do that on Monday. Well, we definitely never have typos in any of my stories on PCPro.com. Never once, uh, and you'll never be able to convince me otherwise. So, um, <laughs> so it's interesting. You, you're talking about they're doing a launch event at PAX, uh, Penny Arcade Gaming Expo. Uh, so we kind of know, I guess, with a, with a product like this, I kind of, I don't know if this is something you guys use internally at Intel, but I would started calling it an E-Class product in uh, the review, right? You've got Ivy Bridge E, Sandy Bridge E, and now Haswell E kind of in that line. Do you guys target this towards gamers? Are you targeting it towards overclockers, towards, you know, you know workstation class users, kind of uh, prosumers, if you will, or, or does it kind of cover all of that? Or do you guys really kind of focus in on one? Well, I think this is a very interesting product, and that's a, that's a great question. Um, this product does target a, a little bit more narrow of an audience. The guys that are out there that really are, you know, time is money, and they need their dedicated hardware to get their job done and get their business done, those guys are going to probably buy the workstation products because uh, they, they can't afford to have downtime. They don't want to overclock. They just want to get their work done, and it's work all the time. You have another group of people that um, have more diverse interests, and so maybe they like to have the best gaming rig around, plus they also might be doing some prosumer video editing on that thing, uh, maybe playing around with a, f a few other threaded applications. So if, they're, if their interests are more diverse, and yet they still like to have a great gaming platform, this really is the target product for them. The, uh, the Core i7-5960, which is the product that we were sent in to review, is the flagship part. It's the Extreme Edition part. It's got that, that X moniker on the back of it, which is always an indicator of several things. One, a fairly high price for a consumer processor, but also you know, peak levels of performance. Uh, one of the things I do like about this version of the Extreme Edition is in past ones, you know, you, the difference between, say, uh, the 4930 and the 4960 has really just kind of been clock speed. And now uh, the differentiation with the 5960X is that it is the only part in this class or in this product lineup for now that has eight cores, right? So you're running at 16 threads. Right. Uh, and it stands out in performance because of that, right? So you're talking about 33% more cores than the 5930 or the 5820, and then 50% or 100% more cores rather than the existing Haswell parts that are out there. Um, DDR4 memory support is obviously important. If you had to pick, I don't know, like what you consider the most important feature on this processor or platform, 
what would you select, right? Are you looking at the cores? Are you looking at the memory as the future of memory interfaces? Are you looking at the chipset and all the connectivity it enables? Well, I don't know. It's like asking a father what's the best feature <laughs> of his new baby, you know? It's like, how do I choose? Um, but honestly, I think the eight cores and the hyper-threading capability to run 16 threads, that's a monster for the highly threaded apps that are out there. And then you pair that with the ability to do some pretty aggressive overclocking and achieve some very high frame rates. And that, that really puts this product into a league of its own. And then that's really where it shines is when you're going to be doing some overclocking and taking advantage of 16 threads, there's nothing that matches it. I would agree with that. I agree with that. I'm going to ask you about overclocking a little bit later on this because I want to get kind of your opinion. But I wanted to ask, uh, we've got a limited amount of time with you. I wanted to ask a couple of questions that are maybe more technical related uh, about the product. I assume that people that are watching this uh, are have, have read our review or have read other reviews of the Haswell E processor. I want to ask, this is the, you know, we've seen Sandy Bridge E and Ivy Bridge E. They all ship with 40 lanes of PCI Express uh, 2.0 in those cases. This, uh, the 5960X and the 5930K ship with 40 lanes of PCI Express 3.0, which, which is a nice boost there. Um, but this time the 5820K ships with 28 lanes of PCI Express. Do you know, like, why was that differentiation made? Was it simply for, to create kind of like product segmentation? Was there a technical reason for it? This was more of a, a business decision, Ryan. So it, it brings that um, killer product that we're bringing out into a, a more attractive price point. So it opens up the ability to get six cores, 12 threads into a more attractive price point. So the more people uh, that may not be able to afford the best that's out on the market, be able to still afford to get a six core processor. Okay. I, and and I, I do like, we were, Ken and I were talking, the guy who's actually running the board behind us doing the engineering about kind of the 5820K being perhaps a better option than the 4820 or the 3820 now because in those previous generations you were limited to four cores which essentially put you on the same core performance level as the mainstream part, right, the regular Sandy Bridge or the regular Ivy Bridge. This time even the baseline Haswell E has 50% more processing power or theoretical processing power than a Haswell part, right, and uh, I think you know, obviously, ideally, I would like to see 40 lanes across the board there, uh, but I, I think the advantage of having two more cores as opposed to having those additional, you know, what is it, 12 lanes of PCI Express, uh, I, I would take the cores over the PCI Express any day of the week because those are going to be used more often. Um, also keep in mind, for 28 lanes of PCI Express, you can still support, what is it, 8, 8, 8, and 4? configurations so you could still do if you want to do three-way graphics you can still do that and then you have four lanes left over for one of those Intel PCI Express SSDs if you want to include one as well right so that is something I think lacks in the in the standard Haswell with only 16 lanes of PCI Express so that's something that uh, these enthusiast class parts definitely have an advantage with um, so this is the first time we have seen DDR4 memory. It's the first time a platform ha has really been using it. Uh, it. We have seen in the past as we transition from DDR to DDR2 or DDR2 to DDR3 that there's kind of this uh, period where you know, the initial launch of DDR3 memory wasn't quite as fast as the peak performance of DDR2. And I think we're kind of still there today with DDR4. Where, where do you think we are in terms of a general overview of DDR4 memory with Haswell E today? That's a great question. I think DDR4 is looking pretty good. Um, you know, there's several ways to evaluate it. I think if you look at the, the price standpoint, we're probably in a better position than we were with the DDR2 to the DDR3 transition. So there's still a premium on DDR4, but really, quite frankly, we're just starting to ramp up the DDR4 with the, these consumer type products driving some high volumes there. So as the, the volume increases, you know, that's typically when the price starts changing on the product. And this will be something that will help drive those volumes for DDR4. Um, the DDR4 is, is healthy. Um, what we're not seeing yet are a lot of the higher frequency DDR uh, chips that, that will be able to come and I expect that to improve over time. Yeah. So right now we're looking at kind of the early 
implementations of DDR4 and uh, while there's a, a power benefit and a potential for frequency upside there I expect both of those to probably improve as people uh, as the DDR uh, technology and infrastructure matures and then uh, typically if history is in the indicator we'll probably see the pricing of DDR4 become more competitive also. Yeah, I mean, I think most of us expected DDR4 to be expensive. It is, you know, it's showing up for sale uh, over the last couple of weeks or so. <clears throat> Excuse me, and it, and it has been fairly steep. Uh, but I think we found today, Kim was pointing out, you can get some like 2133 DDR4 memory for like $210 or so, a 16 gig 4x4 kit. Uh, so you're... You're not totally outside uh, of uh, expectations with higher end DDR3, but of course, uh, companies like Corsair have announced 3,000, 3,200, 3,400 uh, megahertz DDR4 kits. Those are going to be significantly more expensive, and I think those are the ICs that are, are going to be harder to get a hold of. Um, one question I have, again, from, the, from a technical standpoint, is uh, as it appears today, uh, the, 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 the clock system of Haswell E works very much like Haswell does. You have a base clock, you have uh, memory multipliers, you have straps, all that type of stuff going around there. So as it looks now, kind of the, the top memory frequency that we can run while keeping the base clock of the processor at 100 megahertz, kind of stock out of the box settings there, is 266 megahertz. Um, is that something that we will see change? Is that kind of hard-coded into the processor at this point, or will motherboard vendors be able to adjust that in the future? No, absolutely. There's opportunity for moving forward. So um, the, the motherboard vendors do have the ability to change that memory code, uh, so they can adapt and change that themselves. And it's not locked in at hardware. It's not limited at this point. What it is is um, that's what we've been able to validate with the memory that's available to us today. And okay. so what we're doing with the product that's going out, we've configured it so that um, it's been validated with the memory. We know it's going to work for people. And there's still opportunity, though, in the future as the memory speeds up and as we're able to do some more work on validating the faster memories that uh, we can change that code. And uh, also the motherboard vendors themselves have the opportunity, independent of what Intel does, to be able to tweak that and offer variations for themselves. Gotcha. Yeah, because I know with uh, like Corsair sent us a 2800 megahertz kit, and when you enable XMP, it's actually uh, the, the motherboard today has to kind of make a decision about, well, what do I do with that? Because the, the XMP won't allow it to just run at that multiplier. So it changes base clock, changes the multipliers of the processor cores themselves. Maybe not ideal, uh, but for the end user, you're still getting the performance that you would expect when you set it that way. I think from our standpoint, from you know reviewing standpoint, we want to get kind of everything at a baseline level. You know, let's let's change as few knobs as possible as we benchmark and as we iterate through things. So it threw me for a little bit of a loop at first, but uh, we did end up figuring it all out in the end. So um, let me let me ask you this question. So QPI. It was a great idea back in the day, and it's still in use in server and works in you know uh, multi-socket workstation environments. Do you think we'll see a return to QPI as perhaps the interface between processor and chipset? Today, the X99 still connects to the processor through DMI 2.0, which limits you a little bit in terms of accessory bandwidth. Do you think QPI makes a comeback anytime soon, Matt? Well, I agree with you. It's a great interface. And uh, you know has a ton of benefits associated with it. Unfortunately, with this question, Ryan, you got the handcuffs on me. I can't really say anything about the future products that are not announced yet. So uh, I'm going to have to take a pass on this one. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. I can I can accept that because I mean the reason I bring it up is one of the features of the X99 chipset is that hey it supports 10 SATA 6 gigabit per second interfaces, which at first when I was reading these specs and I was getting the motherboards in that support it, I was really excited about uh, the idea of let's hook up 10 SSDs and put them in a RAID 0 array and just see what kind of crazy bandwidth and IOs we can pull. And as it turns out, um, you, know, you, you still have that kind of DMI interface as a bottleneck there and then um, it looks like the, the chipset supports 10 but it's kind of divided up into two controller blocks like with one supporting six channels and one supporting four channels, is that right? Yeah, you have you have two HCI controllers in there, and and one of the controllers you have six, and you can raid those six. So there's six channels available for raiding, 
And then on the other AHCI controller, you have the ability to hook up four um, point connections there. So you can put in those those 10 drives you wanted to put in there, Ryan, and I encourage you to do that. <laughs> um, but uh, you're, you're going to get RAID on six of them, and the other four, you can get great storage and fast speed, but unfortunately, we can't get that RAID. Understood, understood. I, you know, we... we we had some big plans for that. We were going to ask uh, your storage team there. I was like, can we get 10 SSD 730s? Trust me, it's all for science. Uh, <laughs> we want to, to run some tests. So we'll, we'll, we'll think of some other stuff to do. And that Six is still pretty good. Uh, but yeah, and, and I do think it's an advantage for people that do have a lot of SATA devices just to have those, those ports available without having to use third-party yeah. controllers as well. Um, Let's see, we, had a, we have a couple of questions that have filtered in through the chat that I wanted to ask. Do you, and I think I know the answer to this one already. Cyberwire asked, is the current you know, lower speed of DDR4 a bottleneck on the CPU at this point? Boy, let's see. A bottleneck on the CPU. So we've got four channels of uh, DDR4, which, gosh, our, our measured bandwidth is what? 40 gigabytes per second, 40 gigabits per second, gigabytes per second, I believe it is and uh, theoretical even higher than that. So with those four channels of memory, um, I think there are a few things where you can see you know, speed ups, but that would be theoretical um, scientific calculation. So I think <laughs> the spec floating point rate test is able to you know, push that. As far as a lot of real world applications, I, I'm not seeing a lot of performance degradation coming from a, a bandwidth of the memory. Okay, interesting. Um, speaking of individual benchmarks and tests, you know, we, we looked through our review, uh, and one of the, you know, if you look at the, the three parts that are released today, the 5960, the 5930, and the 5820, obviously you have uh, core count as one of the, as the primary difference, right? The, the top end part has eight cores, the lower two parts have six cores, and then obviously you have frequency differences at that point as well. Uh, and even take into account, you know, obviously you are very familiar with the Devil's Canyon parts and like the 4790K. It has extremely high frequencies. Uh, when we look at a part like the 5960X that has a base clock of three gigahertz, and then a part like the 4790K, which is a quad core Haswell Z97 chipset base part, but it has a base clock of four gigahertz. Um, you know, obviously there are some instances, benchmarks or applications that are that tend to be very single threaded heavy, may actually still run better on the uh, you know like the, the 4790K, right? Are there? Um, do you guys at at Intel? Obviously, I, I think you do. Otherwise, you wouldn't make parts like this. Really believe that multi-threaded applications and performance uh, are still it's still a growing segment, right? This is where the this is the direction the industry is going. You know, honestly, there's um, there's a class of applications that benefit from threading. Um, applications and things that pe people do that fall outside of those ca categories. You know, the categories like video editing and 3D rendering and, and mm -hmm. to a an certain extent some gaming. You can see some benefits from adding more threads. Um, outside of those areas, you, you see less of a benefit from threading simply because the uh, the usages don't lend themselves well to a thread level type of parallelism. Um, so I guess you know as I look at that, this product, um, the the E series as you call it, um, <laughs> fits well with those people that need those type of applications and have a diverse um, use of their PCs where they're not just doing one thing but they they like to do things where they need the threading, perhaps, you know, some 4K video mm -hmm. content creation. But then they also like to play their high-end games and maybe have that SLI configuration and running three monitors. This is the platform that really lets them do that. Uh, for people that aren't going to be overclocking, that uh, the 4790K is a great part. You know, if they're yeah, not going to really be is. pushing the clock limits on, on their extreme system, then uh, they get great single thread turbo out of that 4790K. Uh, it runs everything that they do very well, and it's not a bad choice. So I guess my answer would be what we're talking about today really is well suited for a certain group of people, but it's probably not the perfect choice for everyone. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and I think, you know, 
the the and the high enthusiast, the high enthusiast has kind of been hungry for a new part. Ivy Bridge E was a good part, but it was essentially identical to Sandy Bridge E. Um, and Haswell E is kind of like the first big change. You've got the cores, you've got DDR4 memory. Uh, when you look at people who are really really into, you know, if you if you're running three or four GPUs, you're not just doing it because you need. Uh, you need that performance. It's because you want that performance, right? And I think uh, a part like the 5960X or even the other two uh, CPUs that were released today fit that um, probably don't need it in all cases, but you probably want it, right? If you're, if you're that enthusiast, if you're that PC gamer, uh, you know, the, the kind of the, the desirable products are up towards that higher end. All right, and I know we're, we're short on time here with you. I got one other thing I want to ask you. We mentioned overclocking at the beginning. Can you, uh, uh, Intel does not support or warranty overclocked parts and uh, all the normal disclaimers there. What have your experiences been with overclocking on Haswell E? Because I was pretty impressed with what I was able to see in our review. Well, typically what we're seeing is a range. And uh, so, We've been getting a lot of feedback in our labs. We've seen some pretty good overclocks from all of the people that have uh, early reported back some of their testing on these parts. We've seen a range anywhere from perhaps a low of 4.3 gigahertz all the way up to 4.9. Mm. Um, we'll see if uh, anybody comes back in with the 5 gigahertz number, but 4.3 to 4.9, somewhere in that range, we're hearing that these parts are overclocking to that. And people are getting there fairly quickly and easily without having to spend a lot of time tweaking. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, when you look at that compared to the 4790K, you look at that compared to the Ivy Bridge E, um, these are some very respectable overclock numbers. And when you factor in those extra two cores that you get, <laughs> uh, you get some performance that you're not going to match with anything else out there. Yeah, and in and, and my testing, and again, it was kind of, quick and dirty, not spending a whole bunch of time tweaking and getting things. I was able to hit 4.7. Uh, there you go, that's pretty good. On, ours, on, all, on all eight cores, right? So you're mm -hmm. running at 4.7 on all eight cores, which is a, what is that? It's a it's 1.7 gigahertz over base clock, right? So you're talking more than 50% additional clock speed. And if you look at some of the benchmarks, you know, already, already you know, if you look at Cinebench or Pavre, heavily threaded rendering applications, where you are already getting an advantage over every other processor in the field, um, you look at, say, uh, Pavre, you're getting, with the overclock, 36% more performance over that than you were getting before, right? And I think, uh, what did I say here? The, the 5960X, in its overclock state against the 4960X, kind of in its base state, which is six cores, you're talking about an 82% performance difference. Uh, and that's, if, again, for people that want that kind of processing power for those workloads, 82% is a huge number. It's a huge number. It's not apples to apples because we're not comparing overclock to overclock, but when you think about it in that fashion, uh, I think it's pretty impressive. And, you know, you've got to use Pretty decent cooling. It's a, it's a big chip. It gets hot, but um, it's it's able to run it at fairly modest voltages. And we didn't have we didn't have we didn't have a whole lot of problems here doing that. So I, I'm pretty excited about the part. Uh, I think we'll probably in the not too distant future make this platform like our new GPU test bed, right? Which is where we want to take every other potential bottleneck as as far away from the equation as we can and focus on the graphics cards. And that to me is something that we have always done on the highest end platform possible. Uh, available to us at the time, and you know we've done Sandy Bridgey and Ivy Bridgey, and we will move on to uh, Haswell E as well. Yeah, those were some pretty uh, impressive uh, tests you were running there. That's uh, that's pretty nice to be able to overclock up to those frequencies and still run something like a Pavre or a Cinebench and get it to completion and get a score. That that's a nice yeah. stable system. Yeah, we I mean we run we run some stability tests on it for a while. I think we use uh, like Ada sixty four. Uh, and I did have to make a cooler change. The initial cooler we used saw temps up into the 90s, but it was a single 120 radiator <clears throat> closed loop unit. Moved it over to like a Corsair H100, still a very common consumer based cooler. And uh, temperatures were never above 80 C again after that. And uh, I think it worked pretty well. I think we could probably get another 100 megahertz out of it, tweaking voltages and looking at things in uh, another way. Uh, but at this point, it's just so fast. It was so fast already. It's like, well, all right, this is good enough. Let's write this article and be done. So do um, you have anything else, last comments you want to make to people that are watching or anything? I know you've got to run and continue with the busy day uh, for your, your Haswell E-Launch. 
Well, I, I appreciate the time to come on and uh, share with your uh, viewers here. Good, always good talking to you, Ryan. And uh, keep keep trying on that overclocking. See if you can go ahead and get another <laughs> one or two, maybe three hundred megahertz out of that. It's always fun to try, isn't it? Yes, yes, it is. It's definitely fun to do. We'll see you soon, and I'll probably see you in a couple weeks out there at IDF. As I look well. forward to it. Thanks, Matt. Bye.